Hello and welcome to Cookville First United Methodist Church and our YouTube service for April the 18th. We're so excited and pleased that you are with us today and we thank you for joining us in this way. Uh, when you're ready to come back to in-person church, uh, we hope that you will. We're offering two services as we have done historically, one at 8.30 and one at 11 o'clock in our sanctuaries. And when you are ready, we are happy uh, to have you back. We've, we've seen our sanctuary fill up more and more over these past few weeks, and that's been a joy to see. Um, one, one quick note about how we plan to move forward with our YouTube services. On May the 9th, we will switch back to a live stream of our worship services each Sunday. Throughout these past months, as we've been dealing with COVID-19, we have been recording our services throughout the week, and our audio-visual team has been piecing those together to be available on Sunday morning. We are so grateful to all the hard work that the, and hours and hours and hours they put into putting this together. But and now moving back to a live stream, we're um, hoping that you might be a part of the experience of worship that day. So we'll be live streaming our 8.30 services beginning on May the 9th, um, and they will be available after they have fully uploaded to our YouTube channel uh, for all time, if you'd like to come back and revisit anything. Um, otherwise, again, thank you for joining us this, this way. Uh, we are always honored to be in worship with you, however we may be able to worship with you. And as we begin our service, I ask that you would hear these words from Psalm 106. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is, he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord or declare, declare his praise? Happy are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. That's a good word for this day. We hope you enjoy worship. We hope that you find it meaningful and it adds to your spiritual life and your Christian walk. And may the peace of Christ be with you.
Good morning and welcome to Cookville First United Methodist Church. We welcome you to our online worship service this morning. As we hear the call to worship this morning, let us unite our hearts and minds in worship. People of God, the Lord has called you here today. We have come seeking love, hope, and healing. Rejoice for the light of Christ shines on us. Our hearts are full of gladness as we praise the one who promises new life. Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to words of the psalmist we hear psalm 4 answer me when i call o god of my right you have given me room when i was in distress be gracious to me and hear my prayer how long o people shall my honor suffer shame how long will you love vain words and seek after lies but know that the lord has set apart the righteous as god's own the lord hears when i call be angry, but do not sin. Commune with your own hearts in your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart 
than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. Lead me, Lord, lead me in thy righteousness, make thy way plain before my face. for you and will always continue to pray for you but if there is a specific need that you have that we might pray for we encourage you to send that into our church office either by calling us or by emailing it to us we are more than honored to do that um, if you would like to be added to our mailing list please call us as well um, we send out our prayer requests each week along with some church news and some information about worship that week so please let us know how we might be able to help so let us now go to God in prayer Our gracious God, we thank you for all those who have come before us and for the fellowship that we share now with our church family. We thank you for what they have done, for the foundation that they have laid, and for the church that has become what it is due to their hard work. And God, we recognize that we have work to do, that throughout our church, throughout the church, that there are people who are not being served. There are people who are harmed by arrogance and self-righteousness, and we pray that we would open our doors to your presence and to the grace that you would have us to share. We struggle with division and anger. Throughout our world, there are those who strain under the weight of poverty and of neglect and of discrimination and bigotry. May your church May this church, may we as your people shine your light, demonstrate your love, and live out your example so that your kingdom may be seen in the darkest of places. May, may the people around us know of you by how we live. We ask for your blessings upon our community and its ever-widening circles throughout every portion of this earth. May you be seen in all those places and through who we are as your beloved, may you be known. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our risen Savior and our Lord, whom you sent to love and teach to save us all, that we pray the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
In our in-person worship services, we often spend time every week sharing our gifts um, in our response to God's goodness. While we can't do that in our YouTube service, it is good for us to pause and to recognize the goodness of God through the sharing of our gifts. And we thank you for your continued faithfulness to the ministries of this church, even as we worship together this way. So may we pause for just a moment and pray to God out of thanks. Our gracious God, we thank you for the gifts of your generosity and your goodness and for your love of those who are in need. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all that you call us to do and on the gifts that we share that they might bring hope and healing to the world that is around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning's gospel reading is from the first chapter of John, verses 16 through 18. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, as the law was given through Moses. So grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. God, the only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made God known. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Well, good morning, beloved. This morning, we start a sermon series on basically our core beliefs, our Wesleyan heritage. So I want to talk about a legacy of grace upon grace this morning, which obviously comes from our scripture reading from John 1. So just to to get into this um, concept of core beliefs and knowing what they are, having clarity and being able to share those, let me share this story. The, The world's six largest buildings are now beyond the United States. The six largest, tallest buildings are now in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, which is the United Arab Emirates on the Persian Gulf, Malaysia, and China. Actually, China has about six or seven of the top ten tallest buildings in the world now. So our Empire State Building has 102 floors. These buildings now have 200 or more. So amazingly, they have the fastest elevators in the world. I can't imagine taking a ride on one of these elevators to the top, but it only takes one minute, if you can imagine, from going from the bottom to the very top in one minute and then back down in another minute, if you chose to do that, if you didn't stop. So imagine if you had two minutes, one minute up, one minute back down, to tell someone from one of those cultures who God is and how you relate to Him. What would you say? One minute up, one minute down, if you didn't stop. Your ultimate elevator pitch. What would you tell that person about God? So I'm starting this sermon series today about our core beliefs And I'm sharing this series for several reasons. So number one, we need to know our core beliefs and have that clarity and being able to know it in a concise way, what we believe in a convincing way. So what do you believe and why? And could you share it in the ultimate elevator pitch in two minutes? So we, first of all, we need to know that for ourselves, have that clarity for our own faith and faithfulness. Number two, the reason we need clarity right now is that our culture and religious environment is changing at a very, very rapid pace and a chaotic pace. There's a lot of chaos we are becoming more and more of a, a totally secular culture. Secular is defined as beyond the influence of traditional Christian values, beliefs, and practices. That's the definition of secular in our context. So in this secular world that we live in, we need to have clarity of what we believe, who we are as people of God, and what we believe. So that's the second reason, because everything is changing. It's fast-paced and chaotic. The third reason is Methodism, unfortunately, as we have known it, like all other denominations, you just don't see it quite as much, all other denominations is imploding. Methodism is imploding. Think of a denomination as a framework of belief and practice and stability. Denominations in the form that we have all known them are going away. They just are. Now, we are a connectional church denomination. We are not autonomous, local church, congregational churches. We are connected as a denomination. And we have a 250-year history. Our origin uh, is from the Church of England. So we are a connectional church. But 
theological, cultural, political, and even economic forces and issues are bringing about a cycle of fundamental change. If you think about how things change, you move from order to disorder to reordering. Order, disorder, to reordering. So unfortunately, we are caught in a major cycle of disorder, of disordering what has been, what we have known. And so unfortunately, that's the season of time, the time that we live in. Uh, the late writer Phyllis Tickle wrote a book called Emerging Christianity, and she suggested that we are in a 500-year change for Christianity. And I, I believe that. So I'll share more about that as we move along. But we are in the midst of fundamental change and denominations as we have known them in our lifetime are gradually, gradually going away. And so it's a whole new environment. So for all of us as United Methodists, it's the first time since 1844. I just comprehend that. The first time since 1844 that theological and political differences will split the church at least in two or more pieces. Sometime after the end of 2022. And so that's what's looming. The last time the church, the United Methodist, or the Methodist Church, it was the Methodist Church, Episcopal Church, was divided. It was between North and South over the Civil War and slavery. This time, it will be about homosexuality and a whole other number of, of issues, but mainly homosexuality. So we, together, we have to navigate uh, this historic time. And we have time. It will not be probably until 2023 that, you know, the things kind of settle out. We know what the pieces are. And our local church will have to figure out some type of future affiliation. That's 2023 or beyond. So don't get all upset and don't worry about it right now too much. We're going to have conversation about it. But the reality is, the writing is on the wall, Methodism as we have known it will change and morph into new forms in the midst of what is emerging as a new orthodoxy battle, a battle for what defining what is orthodox. And I'll say more about that in a moment. So in all of this, we need to know who we are and what we believe with clarity. So could you tell what you believe, who you are and what you believe as a Christian, a follower of Christ, with Methodist distinctiveness, Wesleyan distinctiveness, would you be able to tell, tell that to someone else in the ultimate elevator ride up one minute, down the next? Well, we need that kind of clarity. So hang with me here. This is important. We're going to think about our Methodist heritage and legacy. If we've received, you know, this influence in our life, we've lived in this environment called United Methodism, then what are our core beliefs? And so, as we think about that, particularly in the context of changing denominational forms, then here's the clarity I think we need. And I, this is what I feel very called and compelled to share with you. Our core beliefs, our core DNA, as you might imagine, and you probably know what's coming, is divine grace. Embodied most profoundly in Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Christ. So divine grace embodied by Christ is our core identity, DNA, and belief. So what you need to know, and you'll hear this often over the next several years, we are Christ-centered and grace-based. 
So that's part of your elevator speech. If someone asks you what you believe as a United Methodist or an evolving Methodist, whatever that may be, you say, well, we are Christ-centered and grace-based. So let's go a little deeper into that. Hang with me here. This is important. We need some historical context. So have you ever wondered why there are so many denominations? Why is Christianity already so split, splintered, and fragmented into thousands and thousands of groups? Literally thousands of groups. And it's splitting more and more these days. Why is that? Well, two words. Two words. Doctrinal disputes. Doctrinal disputes. What I just called orthodoxy wars. The term orthodox means right beliefs. Right belief. So here's the thing. From day one, Christianity was embroiled and has always been divided by arguments over what is right belief. So that's why we have all of these various churches all around us. Every single one. Every single one. You point to any church, and it is a split off from another church over some type of doctrinal belief or dispute. Every single one. This is nothing new. When we read our historic creeds in the early centuries of Christianity, they had to define what is right belief. And so the early bishops gathered in western Turkey at several conferences and they locked them into a room until they could put down on paper, this is what we believe. But not everybody really agreed on that. But from our historic creeds, when they walked out of the room and you went home, whether it was in Europe or North Africa or wherever, you had to abide by that creed or you could even literally be killed for being unorthodox, being a heretic. So that's a long history of Christianity. And so it continues today, arguing over what is right belief, orthodoxy. In the 1500s, you know, we are Protestants, protests, Protestants. We withdrew, along with Luther and those who followed him, we withdrew from the Roman Catholic Church over orthodoxy, an orthodoxy war. You know, I've told you before, I'm I'm kind of into ancestry now, ancestry.com, and I'm researching all of these branches of my family. Do you know that every single branch of my family, the branches came from Germany, from England, and from Switzerland. Every single one, every branch of my family got to America because of religious wars. All the way from the 1600s up through the 1800s. They were part of mostly Protestant groups that were persecuted for their beliefs, and therefore they made their way to America. So it's part of my personal story, and it's caused by doctrinal disputes. Now hang with me here. In the 1700s, our founder, John Wesley, got into heated but nonviolent Disputes with lots of other theologians and preachers and religious people over what is right belief. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about Protestant theology and how it has produced all of these various churches. Point to any church around us and we are the heirs of some type of doctrinal dispute. So from the Protestant Reformation, pulling out of the Roman Catholic Church, there are basically three large branches of Christianity in America, in the West. Three large branches. There are the original Reformers, who are the Lutherans. We have a Lutheran church in town. We have Presbyterians, which were followers of Calvin, John Calvin. 
you know, the Presbyterian church is right across the street, Cumberland Presbyterian. So that's the early reformers. Then you had the Anabaptist, Anabaptist, Baptist, meaning rebaptizers. They did not accept and do not accept the previous baptisms of liturgical churches from a Roman Catholic or Anglican, which is what we come from, uh, infant baptism, the Anabaptist rebaptizers. So, if you ever wonder where that came from. And then our branch is from the Church of England, the Anglicans, and it was a blend from Roman Catholic churches, the Roman Catholic tradition, and the Protestant tradition, kind of a blending in England out of which John Wesley came. And so those are the three branches. So doctrinal disputes. Here is the heart of the matter. Here's where we start this week. So John Wesley was our founder. We have our origin in the Anglican church. And he disputed several. He agreed with John Calvin in many, many ways, but there were a few fundamental disputes. So Calvinists believed and believe that humanity's fall into sin became total depravity. Now, if you have any background with John Calvin, you know you're familiar with, and even in Baptist circles, the acronym TULIP. So the T is total depravity. You are a rotten sinner, bound for hell. When we fell as humanity into sin, then that meant that because of original sin and that fall into sin, that by nature we are totally depraved. So John Wesley believed that we are hopeless sinners. I'm sorry, John Calvin believed that we are hopeless sinners. So one of John Calvin's students named John uh, Arminius got to a point in his understanding and belief where he disagreed with Calvin. Maybe because he read the first chapter of the Gospel of John that we just read. So let's read this again. From Christ's fullness, Christ-centered, grace-based, from Christ's fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. Christ-centered, grace-based. It's right there. No one has ever seen God. God, the only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. So, Jacob Arminius came to believe that John Calvin's view of limited grace was not correct. And so, he came to believe that because of Christ, divine grace is available to all. Available. Divine grace, God's extravagant, steadfast love is available to all. Available. So, the followers of Arminius, Arminianism, like John Wesley, believe in the free and widely available divine grace of God through Jesus Christ that is sufficient for salvation by faith for any and all believers. So that was a split between Calvin and Arminius and therefore Wesley. So through Wesley and the Church of England as our origin, this belief in the freely available divine grace of God is our theological legacy. That is our legacy. It is our DNA. That's why I focus on it so much. It is the core of the core of our belief. And so we even believe in prevenient grace. Prevenient, meaning to go before. 
we all know the 23rd Psalm, the last line says, one of the last, you know, nearly the last line says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In Hebrew, you have to translate the tense of the verbs by context. So some scholars, including our Bishop Will Willimon, says that in Hebrew it can mean follow me, but it can also mean proceed me or pursue me. So surely God's goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life until I end my journey in the house of the Lord. So God pursues us with His steadfast love, His grace. God is always out ahead of us. Prevenient grace. So that's our legacy. That's our story. That's our identity. That's our core belief. And so there in your, uh, well, you don't have a bulletin here on the screen. We have a list of, we call, call these Wesley's Alls. And we'll come back to these each week. But let's look at these. All need to be saved, which is the fall into sin. All need to be saved. All may be saved. All may know they are saved. And all may be saved to the utmost. But a grace is available to all. So that is our legacy. The freely available grace of God is our core belief. So we need clarity about that. We need to hold on to that. And one of my concerns about the changing forms of Methodism and all of this denominational change is that that voice and legacy of grace will be lost, will not hear, not as long as I'm with you. It is our core identity, our DNA, our core legacy of the core of the core of our belief. Grace upon grace. So we need to know that. So here's your first elevator, elevator statements. Are you ready? Here's what we can start with. If you're beginning that right up and you're, you're sharing with someone else, what's your core belief from a Methodist Wesleyan perspective? How do you start? How do you start explaining it? Well, here it is. Divine grace is available to all. Grace upon grace, all means all. And God is always out ahead of us, preparing to love us and for our good. So, that's the core of our belief, grace upon grace. So someone asks you, what do you believe? What's your core belief? Say, grace upon grace. We are Christ-centered, grace-based. Divine grace is available to all. All means all, and God is always out ahead of us. That's our core belief. So, that's the beginning of our elevator speech. That's the beginning core value and belief of our Wesleyan heritage. So, the next several weeks, we'll look at more. But we start with grace upon grace. And so, we're here to share the story of grace in the heart of town and in ever-widening circles and so I hope the next several weeks help us to do that more effectively. So I share this legacy of grace upon grace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has good to me, his word my hope secures, he will my shield and portion be as long as life and Bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first be gone. And now may the saving and transforming grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the living Lord, rest and abide with each and every one of you, both now and forever. Amen.